Mamit is the director of product marketing for Mix Signal 5 IP at Synopsys. He brings more than 20 years of experience in product marketing, product management, and system engineering covering ASP, ASIC, and IP products for a broad range of applications. Mamit holds a Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from University of Toledo and an MBA from San Diego State University. And the title of his presentation today is Enabling the Era of Multi-Die Systems with UCIE. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome Mamit Walia. Thank you, thank you. Can, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. All Very right, nice. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, thanks, and let me know if my, the screen is visible now. Very clear. All right, Very thank nice. you. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will be covering the topic of uh, multi-die systems, also known as chiplets. Uh, but at Synopsys, we like to call them multi-die systems. And uh, so uh, I will be talking about the market dynamics that are leading to the rapid adoption of multi-die systems. And uh, I will also talk about why Synopsys believes that UCIE will become the preferred interface for the multi-die systems. Uh, so I wanted to start with uh, what we call as systemic more era at Synopsys. Uh, so basically uh, the key point here is that the Moore's law is very much alive, but it is now happening at the systemic level and uh, multi-die systems will continue to scale the SOCs to that next level of complexity and higher functionality. Uh, so again, at Synopsys, we call it systemic more, and uh, this is where we see a lot of uh, traction happening in the market. So if we, if we look at all the analyst reports and the various talks from industry experts, uh, you know, multi-die systems are accelerating at a very rapid pace. Uh, there are projections of, of about 5x growth in next five years. Uh, there are projections about of about 10% of the advanced SOCs now being the multi-die systems are being done as chiplets over the period of next five years. Uh, there's massive, massive innovations happening in the areas of packaging. Uh, and it is happening across all of the market segments. It's being led by high performance compute, but it is happening across all of the uh, various different market segments and various different applications. All right, so at Synopsys, being an EDA vendor and an IP provider, we have a very broad view of the market. We work with hundreds of customers that are building their SOCs. Uh, so we have a very broad view of what's happening in the world of semiconductors. And I can tell you today, we are tracking somewhere between 60 to 80 opportunities that are now what is referred to as chiplets or multi-die systems. So we're working with 60 to 80 unique logos uh, that are building multi-die systems. Uh, and again, like, like I said before, these are primarily in the area of high performance compute uh, being led by uh, CPUs and AI server type of chips. Uh, but, but we see it happening all across, right? Even in mobile segments and consumer segments and automotive and storage and networking, et cetera. And then on the right side there, you can see the splits, how we see these opportunities split by the advanced, mostly in the advanced spin pet nodes, but you can see a split here of three, five, seven nanometer, and then 12 and 16 nanometer. Okay. Now, uh, so what is driving this adoption of chiplets or multi-die systems? And the answer is it's both the physics and the economics of the problem. Uh, so multi-die systems are being built both to solve the physics of the problem and economics of the problem. Uh, there are some examples, you know, right now the max reticle size is around 850 millimeters square or so. 
uh, with with uh, with the interposer with the chiplet approach, we can double it now, and in near future, this can be four x of what the max reticle size is today. Uh, it enables our customers to build multiple SKUs, SKUs, and I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, these systems are being built for for reuse and to lower risk and to enable faster time to market, which all in turn means lower cost uh, for better area or improved form factor with multiple dyes on a package versus multiple packages on a board. And then lower power because of the shorter links that these uh, UCIE and XSR type of links will enable. So again, many, many different reasons why multi-die systems are being built and why they're taking off so rapidly. Uh, and again, there are some very aggressive uh, targets from various analysts and industry experts on how the chiplet revenue is going to grow in next couple of years. Uh, so a lot of bullish forecasts around, around chiplets and multi-die systems. Okay. Now, uh, here we are again showing some real world example of how uh, this chiplet approach is leading to a lower system cost. And essentially the example is showing what will happen when you break up a single monolithic die into four smaller dies. Uh, basically what it leads to is, uh, you know, uh, even though the overall silicon area is increasing, your assembly costs are going up with chiplets, but your yields are significantly improving when you're building smaller dies versus a one big die. And, and in this example, it's, it's, this example is by Lindley Group. Uh, in this example, the, we're getting a net saving of about 13% or so. And again, there are many models that are being built now uh, to capture this cost savings of multi-die systems, uh, and they're getting more and more complex. Uh, but but you know, the general consensus is that multi-die systems will lead to uh, lead to uh, cost savings, net cost savings in in compute SOCs and in general uh, high-end SOCs. All right, so moving on, uh, at Synopsys, we basically uh, group these chiplets into four broad categories or four broad use cases slash applications. Uh, so what we are showing here is an example, four examples, uh, homogeneous dyes on the left side in the left column there and heterogeneous dyes on the right side. Uh, so if you look at the top left, it's basically scaling of processors or scaling of compute SOCs. And uh, this is happening in all advanced nodes, basically allows us to build cluster of CPUs. It allows us to build scalable systems with multiple SKUs. Uh, and again, great examples are CPUs or accelerators. Uh, the, the left bottom is what we call as split. So scale and then split at the bottom left. And this is a classic example of where you are basically spilling out of your max reticle size. You're approaching your max reticle size. Uh, so either you have very poor yield or, or you just cannot fit inside the reticle. And again, examples here are large switches or big accelerators, ML chips. And again, this is all about splitting the die because you just cannot fit in one big die and it leads to lower cost and better yields, et cetera. On the right side, we are showing examples of heterogeneous dyes. So the top left is aggregating functions. Uh, we bring together multiple functions to reduce form factors. Uh, examples here are 5G base station. You know, you're bringing uh, different functions, RF functions, digital functions that are implemented in better in different nodes. And examples are BBUs, RRVUs, you know, in a base station. Co-package optics is another example, a futuristic example of this. And then at the bottom left is a classic disaggregating the IOs. So you, you build your central, uh, central core in one node and you disaggregate the high-speed ethernet, the high-speed PCI, et cetera, and another node there. Uh, so that's, that's an example. So again, we, we split it in these four different types, scale, split, aggregate, and disaggregate. And that's how we see the world of die-to-die -die or multi-die interfaces. All right, so these are again, some of the very public examples that we are talking about here, uh, starting with AMD and top left, the Ryzen uh, Epic uh, server chipsets. 
this is an example of both the scale and the disaggregation happening together. Uh, the, the next one on the bottom uh, left is the Amazon Graviton. I think in a speaker earlier from mom gave this example. This is an example of disaggregating the IOs. Uh, then we have on the right top, we have the Apple example. Uh, this is again, very recent with the M1 Ultramax CPUs. A very classic, classic example of uh, uh, scaling the compute power and creating SKUs. And the last one on the bottom left is the Intel Intel Ponte Vecchio, which is kind of the holy grail of everything, right? They've implemented all of these four use cases that I just talked about, scale, split, aggregate, disaggregate, in a single massive multi-die system uh, with lots of chiplets around. Uh, so that that's, uh, that's, like I said, it's the holy grail of multi-die systems, Intel Ponte Vecchio. All right, uh, just wanted to just wanted to look a little deeper into the Apple M1 Ultra uh, chipset. And basically you can see here, they had series of their CPUs with M1, M1 Pro, M1 Max. And then, you know, after that point, you know, scaling it to the next level made sense with the multi-die systems where they've essentially put two M1 Maxes together, calling it the M1 Ultra. And what they have accomplished here is uh, they've created multiple SKUs. You know, maybe one CPU would go into a laptop, two CPUs would go into a desktop and so on. Uh, they have achieved area power efficiency with massive die-to-die -die bandwidth across uh, die-to-die -die interface. And, and so this is again, a classic example of how Moore's law, you know, it will make both sense from economics and physics perspective to adopt multi-die systems after a certain stage of scaling. Uh, and as at, with these multi-die systems, there is also a lot of innovation happening in the area of packaging. And what we are showing here is examples of a transition from 2D to 2.5D to 3D die stacking. Uh, we would say again, from our vantage point, 3D is a little bit more futuristic, especially at the, at the logic level. It may be happening at the memory level, but from logic level, it's more futuristic. Uh, but we are showing an X and Y axis here. X axis uh, going left to right is higher IO density, higher IO count. Uh, and the Y axis going up is more co cost and complexity. So again, very simple organic substrate is a 2D package uh, it's the it's the least complex in terms of IO density and the IO count, but it's also the cheapest. About 60, 65% use cases that we see are with the organic substrate. Uh, then on the right side there, we are showing interposer and silicon bridge together. Uh, let me just actually, uh, do. We're, we're showing the silicon interposer and the bridge together. These are again, more advanced packages, higher IO density, but they're also more costly and more, more expensive. The basic rule here is when our customers are using HPM type of DRAMs, then they would move to interposer type of technology for multi-die systems. And then in the middle here, we are seeing RDL fan out also referred to as integrated fan out. And this is kind of the happy medium between organic substrate and interposer. But, but we still consider, we, we still see very few customers doing RDL fan out today. Now it may pick up in the future, uh, but today uh, it's more of a niche technology that sits between the two, the two extremes of organic substrates and the silicon interposer slash bridge. And again, hybrid bonding 3D is more futuristic. It's, it's not happening too much at the logic level. So that's our view of what's happening in the world of packaging. Uh, now moving on. Uh, now moving on to the interfaces, right? And and the reality is that it has been a lot of clutter and confusion in when it comes to D2D interfaces. All of the big tier ones had their own proprietary interfaces, and even within these standards, right? We had we had four alliances and five standards with OIF, bunch of wires, Open HPI, AIB, and and UCIE. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to make this simple. You know, ever since the UCIE has come along, we believe that UCIE, as the name implies, is truly, truly universal, and it is the most comprehensive standard. We, we believe that UCIE will prevail long term over everything else. Uh, that's, that's our prediction based on the very broad view of the semiconductor world we have. 
And uh, based, what we are showing on this slide is a summary of all these standards. Uh, again, we are we've put the bandwidth uh, per beachfront on the on the x-axis, power on the y-axis. Uh, power goes from high to low. You want to be on the top right of this of this graph. Uh, we are showing these various standards in different colors, uh, and and we're showing uh, the colored circles and the empty circles. Colored circles basically means advanced packages. Uh, interposers or advanced packages. Empty circles mean the organic substrates. Uh, this summary here is that we believe UCIA offers the best metrics in terms of bandwidth per beachfront, in terms of power, and in terms of latency. Uh, we believe that 16 gig version of UCIA will be the sweet spot for next couple of years. Although UCIA will be defining 32 gig, and that's a little bit futuristic next three to four years out. Uh, but we believe compared to other standards, UCIE has the best uh, metrics in terms of the three metrics I just provided. So, so uh, just to put summary here, uh, at Synopsys, we, we believe that, that, that UCIE will win for basically three simple reasons. It has the best technical metrics in terms of energy efficiency, uh, in terms of the edge efficiency and in terms of latency. Number one is best technical metrics. Number two, it's the most comprehensive and the most future-proof standard. It supports all the use cases we talked about, scale, split, aggregate, disaggregate. It supports all the package types. It, it is the only interface protocol that supports the complete, complete protocol stack for, for cache coherent, non-cache coherent, CPU, accelerator, all of the different use cases. And then it is future-proof with a roadmap to 32 gigabits per second. And the third reason for why UCIE will prevail is it has the broadest ecosystem. So uh, it has the CPU vendors, Intel, AMD, ARM. It has the foundries, TSMC, Samsung, it has uh, packaging vendors like, uh, like ASC. Uh, recently, Alibaba and Vidya have joined uh, the, the board of directors. Uh, it has hyperscalers like Meta and Microsoft and Google Cloud. So it has the most comprehensive ecosystem, the best technical merits, and the most, com and the most comprehensive and future-proof. And that's why we believe at Synopsys that UCIE will prevail over everything else in the world of D2D. All right. So at Synopsys, we believe in UCIE. Uh, we have deployed a huge R&D team to work on the UCIE solution. Uh, we, this is a new standard just announced, uh, I believe end of March, April timeframe. We are running as fast as we can to, to build up the full UCIE stack and full UCIE solution. Uh, and that's what we're showing here for the five, we are working on all advanced FinPET nodes, both orientations, all package types, uh, for the controller, again, UCIE supports multiple protocol options, and we're building all of that with the bridges and the, and the authentication engines for security. Uh, I'd like to point out here that UCIE protocol stack is different from everything else. Uh, UCIE has pushed a lot of complexity down into the physical layer. It has what it refers to as an adapter layer, and then it has a flipped die-to-die -die interface and multiple protocol options on the top. Streaming is just a wire for proprietary protocols, CXL for cache coherent and PCIe for non-cache coherent. And then at Synopsys, we are looking at this as a one Synopsys solution. It goes way beyond the FI and the controller. It goes, we go into the package expertise, interposer expertise, uh, security engines through our acquisition of elliptic technologies, test and diagnostics, uh, life cycle management type of features, the NOC bridges. Uh, and then we wrap it up with our EVA tools, subsystem services, signal integrity, power integrity, uh, verification IPs, and ZBOOF. So it's a very, very comprehensive uh, solution for die-to-die -die interfaces. Uh, UCIE, like I said, enables multiple package types, advanced packages, and also standard packages. And this is just showing a comparison of PPAs with advanced packages, we can get more density. With standard packages, it's less density, but it's cheaper. Uh, and it's just showing the power and area and performance trade-offs between the two package types. Uh, it requires different FIs for, for standard package versus advanced package. 
Uh, the advanced package is more dense. Each module would carry 64 pins versus in standard package, basic each module carries 16 pins. Uh, so this is a comparison here. I'll, I'll leave this slide with you. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. Uh, and, and then uh, basically the UCIE PHY is a very simplistic, minimalistic PHY, but most of the, it's a DDR type of a PHY clock forwarded architecture. We're building a 16 gig uh, per pin at this point. Uh, and then it's packaged together with a lot of known good die type of features. Uh, so the slide is again showing, uh, but, but most of the complexity is beyond the fights into the controller and everything else I just showed you on the previous slide. Now, now for the controller, uh, it's an interface at two gigahertz level. Like I said, the UCIE has pushed a lot of uh, complexity back into the file layer in terms of link training, et cetera. And then we have an adapter that then manages the protocol layers. UCIE allows three protocols, uh, a PCIe-based protocol, a CXL-based protocol. Uh, both are FLIT-based, which is fixed packet type as recently defined by PCI6. And then we have the streaming interface, which is nothing but just a wire where you can carry any proprietary traffic. It also allows for sideband signaling that allows the two sides to do the handshaking. Uh, and, and so, like I said, it's the most comprehensive standard with multiple protocol options. Uh, now, what UCIE has allowed is it has allowed multiple uh, use cases with the three protocols, proprietary, PCIE, and CXL. Uh, it is allowing cache coherent and non-cache coherent interfaces. Uh, so here we are showing how with the PHY and the controller, it allows multiple use models of CPU to CPU, uh, CPU to accelerator, CPU uh, accelerator to accelerator for cache coherent functions, uh, to memory interfaces and to the IO interfaces. So again, these three protocols that have been defined can be used to optimize for these different use cases to interface the CPUs, the, 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 the accelerator chips, uh, the memory chips and the and the I/O chips, uh, and and this again shows how comprehensive the standard is to address all of these different type of use cases. Uh, as I get towards the end of my presentation, I want to say that the the challenges for die to die interfaces are way beyond just the just the interface itself, just beyond the UCI PHY and the controller. And that's what we are trying to show here that, that the, the challenges abound are, are basically many, many challenges for wide scale adoption of chiplets. Uh, these challenges have to do with complex packaging, thermal management, uh, you know, getting the latency down, getting the, worrying about the assembly cost, uh, you know, making sure that UCIE or become, you know, getting to a consensus for a standard interface uh, coherency across multiple dies, you know, software development, you know, power modeling, new attack vectors, security, etc. So many, many different challenges need to be addressed for for chiplets and for multi die systems to become wide stream uh, and get broad adoption. And and that's how we are looking at this problem at Synopsys, where we are offering one Synopsys solution that go way beyond IP. Uh, into it, it is tightly coupled with our with our 3D IC EDA tool. Uh, we are providing various tools for verification, for system sign offs, for thermal power analysis, uh, test and repair, sili silicon lifecycle management, uh, you know, package design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, again, the idea here is to engage early with art architecture partitioning and then provide every tool that is required to build a true multi-die system. Uh, this is an example of our 3D IC compiler tool, which wraps many different tools. And the idea here again is to offer full complete services from exploration to final sign off of the design. And this is industry's only integrated solution tool for 2.5D and 3D multi-die designs. Uh, so this is the Synopsys 3D IC compiler EDA tool. 
And 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 finally, uh, I want to say that Synopsys offers a very broad portfolio of IPs. Uh, we are also offering IP subsystems, uh, which includes the Phi and the controller and the you know all the clock reset logic with the control registers and the debug logic and the test logic and so on. Uh, and, and so we are offering the IP, the IP subsystem and the IP chiplets is just the next thing in this journey uh, towards offering the multi-die systems. So our chiplets would be based on silicon proven high quality IP portfolio with a lot of flexibility in terms of your packaging options, a lot of customizations for target uh, applications and, and a full solution that addresses all the problems of multi-die systems that we just talked about. Uh, so again, just to wrap it all up, uh, there are significant system benefits to designing multi-die systems. These are both related to physics and economics of the challenges that we have to navigate. And Synopsys is the preferred EDA and IP partner for multi-die systems. Uh, so. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mamit. Uh, yeah, I, I think you said it well when you mentioned the four alliances, four alliances, five standards, and it seems like uh, every vendor has their own unique solution to this. And I, and, and you know, it's, it's good to know that there is a hope that you know we are you know it's, um, we're consolidating to a standard that can make it easy for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> and thank you for sharing that comprehensive solution from you know well known the EDA company. 